بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ما بعد uh, So in chapter 6 you actually have Ghazali he's going to close out these last three chapters talking about sexual desire um, Up until this point he spent a lot of time on hunger uh, a lot of time on starvation a lot of time uh, controlling that and he then he closes up with with lust and sexual desire Why do you think he waited so long to talk about this? Or why discuss hunger first? Is there a relationship or no? Or you guys don't think so? Yeah. Sure. Okay. So one of the ways the Prophet Sallallahu advised us to control our desire and our control our lusts is through what? Fasting. Through fasting. So he, basically the reason that he precedes hunger with sexual desire is because one of the means of actually controlling your desire is through your stomach, right? Um, uh, it's a very famous English idiom. I'm sure you guys are familiar. The way through a man's heart is, is to through his, is through his stomach, right? <laughs> Not necessarily true, but, uh, you know, it, it is very telling on the role that the stomach has and how it affects other organs, right? And how it affects other things and how he even, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, not just recognized, but actually tells us that one of the ways to actually weaken that lust is to weaken yourself physically, you know, through fasting and through uh, hunger. So sexual desire, uh, why does it happen or why does, why did Allah even bring it? Why did he instill it in mankind? Ghazali, he mentions two reasons. What, what do you guys think? I think one is, one is, I mean, I think they're both pretty obvious, but one reason is enjoyment, right? <laughs> I think that's pretty obvious. And the second reason is for procreation, to have children. So these are the two reasons that Ghazali mentions that Allah instills this sense of uh, sexual desire so that it allows the human race to continue on. And it is a means of seeking pleasure. But and he focuses a little bit more on this pleasure uh, part of it, saying that, okay, <clears throat> there are two major feelings that, that we have as people. One of them is pleasure. And the other one, which is, what is the opposite of pleasure? Pain. Right. So he's saying that these these two feelings, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has actually given them to us for a reason. And what do you guys think that reason is? If we relate it to religion somehow. Or is there is there no re relationship? So one of the reasons he actually mentions is that these are these are tangible experiences, right? These are things that we can actually feel and things that we experience in our life. And if we understand that pleasure and pain are both tangible experiences, both of them lead to something as well. And what is it that they lead to? These serve as an encouragement for paradise and they serve as a deterrence from hellfire. Why is that? So how can we say pleasure would encourage us to seek paradise and pain would deter us from seeking the hellfire. I, I, even more base than that. Because over here, we're talking about sexual desire, right? So why allow this experience of pleasure? Or, you know, why allow this pain? He mentions that this, it, they actually serve as encouragements. So my question would be how? several reasons. Huh, please share. Like one is like um, we know that these pleasures exist, especially if they're halal. Sure. We know that Allah has something he has greater pleasures for you. Okay, mashallah. No, absolutely. I, I agree with you 100 percent So if this is just a taste of the pleasure of the heights of the pleasure of this world, how much more pleasurable is the akhirah going to be, right? Like if intercourse and being intimate 
is a means of seeking such high pleasure, how much more pleasurable will the have afterlife be? And then consequently also pain, right? So the pain that we experience, how much more excruciating is the hellfire going to be? How much more so is it going to be magnified in the afterlife? So these experiences help, they're actually tangible, right? We can actually feel them. We can actually experience them. And because we have a taste of them, and we understand that this is the peak of both, right? The peak of pleasure and the peak of pain. That is within our limits in this world. In the next world, the limits go even, like it, basically like it breaks the doors down and the limits are even further beyond that. Uh, so there are two verses that uh, Ghazali mentions. Lord, do not burden us more than what we have strength to bear. <laughs> Here he says this is talking about sexual desire. And he mentions here, he says, Woman the harm in the night when darkness gathers. He mentions Ibn Abbas. He actually talks about the, <laughs> he talks about a male when he, a man when he gets excited at night. And because this happens at night, he's alone with his thoughts. And he is the harm that happens <laughs> in the night. Uh, I just thought there were like really interesting parallels that he brings. Uh, so desire for women, this is something, this is a very strong motivator for men, right? It's something that men are forever seeking. It is something that men are forever going after. The Prophet wasallam said that I did not leave behind a greater fitna for a man than, than women. Um, and you, you see this in, in the modern world in, in a variety of different ways. You know, when we talk about power dynamics between genders, it is very rare that you will see a woman at the height of her career with a family established, willing to give it all away for some guy, right? The opposite you find holding much more true in many more cases, where a man will be at the height of his career with a family, he'll have everything that he needs, but he's willing to throw it all away for a few fleeting moments of pleasure. And this is a very, and it's not justifying what these men do, but it's a very basal uh, instinct that that most men have. So he's saying that there are three ways or three things that happen in regards to this desire. He's a, he, either there is going to be excess, or okay. So he's saying if there, there's too much, what is the other problem? Too the too little, absolutely. And then what is the third? <laughs> Balanced. <laughs> <laughs> so equilibrium. So basically, it's going to say too much or too little, or it's going to be balanced. Uh, and these are the three ways or the three types of desire that happen. So in excess, there are two things that can happen. There are two things that can happen in excess. One of them is that the, the first thing is that when a person has reached a, that level of shahwa, that level of drive, his intellect is overcome. He, he's, he's not thinking straight anymore. And one of two things happens. Um, either he develops this insatiable drive right? This insatiable drive for, for lust, or he becomes obsessive with a particular person, right? He said, I will only find um, fulfillment in that person. I will only find fulfillment in that individual, what we call like a, a ishq, right? Like this, this high level of passion that an individual has for someone. And he says, both of these are actually results of pain. Why? And why does he liken it to pain? That's how they escape. Uh, right? So that's how, because what happens is you keep trying to what? Remove the pain, right? It just keeps coming back and you keep trying to remove it. And it's going to be in one of these two ways, right? You just have this insatiable appetite that you keep trying to fill the appetite, right? So he's liking that to pain. It'd be, you keep trying to fill this appetite or you become, keep becoming obsessed with this particular person and, and it just becomes insatiable. It's, and it's almost like it's painful. Uh, so excess, he says that there are ways to deal with excess. He says, number one, avoid repeated glances. He's actually saying to take physical steps. Uh, the other thing is having the correct mindset. What do we mean by that? This is a problem that I have in the masjid many times. That the first thing that, that guys do when they come into the masjid is what? Right, they start talking about the girls. They, why, or talking about the problems. Uh, there's, there's a brother I knew 
uh, we were walking around. Every time he would see a girl, he'd be like, stuck for the law. So I said to him, I was like, I was like, bro, stop. Just, just stop. Like, stop it. I said, by you saying that, you're just drawing attention to yourself. What exactly are you trying to accomplish by saying stuff like what? Like, what are, you, what are you doing right now? Do you really think this is the best way to deal with it? Just shut up and look away. Like, <laughs> there's, no, there's no reason for you to yell out like a stuff for Allah. You are creating your own, this own mindset. So this, this hypersexual mindset is something that we have created ourselves, right? This is not, and we actually have control over that. Right. You, Ghazali, when he talks about excess, when he talks about being, you know, uh, too little, and he talks about seeking that equilibrium, having the correct mindset actually helps understand on how to deal with that, how to deal with that lust. And that's something that's really important. He also mentions <clears throat> that if I don't have the correct mindset, then this lust can actually manifest in different parts of my life. It can be for houses, it can be for cars, it can be for food, it can be for so many other things, because I never corrected that mindset. And if I allow myself to, to express my shahwa, to express my desire in this way, unchecked, then this will start creeping into other parts of my life. Uh, and it can become consuming, right? It can consume our lives and actually take us away from, from deen. Um, and it's important to understand that reigning in these desires can be very difficult. Right, it can be very challenging. He actually likens it to like a horse going and racing toward a door. Right, he's saying that if you have it by the reins, it's easy to what? It's easy to control. Right, when you have the reins, you can actually control it. He said, "What if you're behind it trying to pull it by the tail?" Right, it's just going to drag you. Right, you're you're not going to get anywhere, and the horse will probably just get angrier. And this is the same way he talks about shahwa. This is the same way that he talks about desire that an individual needs to learn how to rein these, and it's going to take time. It's not easy. It's not like, okay, you know, I'm going to correct my mindset. I'm going to stop looking, and khalas, I'm done. Uh, the, la the next thing he talks about is defects, right? So he's saying if, they're, if it falls short, if they're, the desire for women is not in excess, but it actually falls short. He's saying this is a problem too. He says it's a problem because it leads to an indifference in women. Like, you know, women are not an object. Right, and women don't don't exist, and this can causes insufficient pleasure in them. So a man will not actually he will actually not seize to he will not seek to satisfy his wife. He said this is why it becomes a problem, and this is why it's important that pleasure. So he's basically telling us that having pleasure or having that lust is something that is important for us to have in our lives. It's not something that we should dismiss, but we need to have a, a healthy balance of it. Uh, and the last thing is equilibrium. Right, so equilibrium, how to have that balance and how to attain that balance. He mentions a few things. He says there are a few tools that we can actually help us bring that equilibrium. The first of them is hunger. The second of them is marriage. Uh, and he says that these two are the main ways of actually reining that in. I think his advice here is actually, should be he should have included it in the end. These are actually practical steps that we can all take to help us control our desires. And glancing, looking, talking, flirting, right? All of these things, they need to be reined in. They need to be controlled. And the best way to do that is to make sure that we are cognizant of our actions. That's the most important thing. What is it that I'm doing right now? If I understand what it is that I'm doing right now, it becomes that much easier for me to deal with the person in front of me. So if I'm dealing with a guy, I'm dealing with a girl, it doesn't, it doesn't matter who it is. If I am aware of my facial expression, if I'm aware of what I'm saying, if I'm aware of how I'm saying it, that is one of the best ways to keep my desires in check because I'm constantly monitoring, my, monitoring myself. Okay. Do, and do I feel attracted at this point? Do I need to start scaling back the conversation, right? Having this constant uh, self-monitoring it's one of the best ways to keep all of these things in check because that mindset is something that is fundamental here. And he's saying that, you know, there are a few, there are with hunger and, uh, and marriage, I think these are important, they help, but is it possible that these satisfy those desires all the time? No, it's not. I think there are other things that have to be brought in, in addition to the hunger and the marriage. I think these are good outside ways of dealing with it, right? But there, there are a number of internal ways that need to be discussed and talked about. 
in order to, to really conquer this because it's, it's not as easy as sometimes uh, it's, it's presented, right? It's just like, oh, okay, just go hungry and get married, right? This not, it's not always the way. If a, pro, if a person really fundamentally has like a shahua issue or he has a lust issue, um, marriage isn't always the solution. It's part of the solution for sure. But he's just talking about dealing with external factors and it's important to always keep in mind the internal ones as well. Uh, the next chapter, chapter seven, so this is the chapter before the book actually ends, um, is where he talks about uh, marriage. And he says marriage is not something that should be denounced. There are individuals who, who talk about marriage like, okay, no, you know, it takes away from the path of Allah, you know, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he could have had even more wives, but his wives were actually to get him out of a, an extremely elevated state. <laughs> Huh? Have you heard someone like say this? I have. It's, it sounds it sounds kind of ridiculous though. I'm not <laughs> like I, like denouncing marriage. Like I don't. It doesn't it doesn't make any sense. Like I I understand the point they're trying to make, and I think it's a bit of an exaggeration. It's you know like the exaggerations when we talked about going hungry. I think it's the same kind of thing. I don't think it's a complete denouncement of like okay no not marriage, but there are certain aspects of marriage that an individual should be aware of and be cognizant of. Like if you get married and all you're doing is fulfilling your desire, like if that's all you're doing, is that the right reason to get married? No, I mean, there are other priorities that we have in our life in developing a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like, you know, it's just like eating all the time or sleeping all the time, right? You can, doing too much of one thing is not healthy. That, that it shows that there's a shortcoming in the mindset. Um, I, I understand like, okay, there's, there's an amount of desire that, an individual wants to fulfill like in, in the initial stages of marriage. But it's completely understandable. But if this is something that is constantly consuming our lives, this is where it becomes an issue and this is where it becomes a problem. Uh, so he's saying don't denounce marriage and don't make it your life goal, right? <laughs> Mar marriage is not a goal. I, I want to be very clear on that. The goal is, is Allah, right? That's, that's the goal. Marriage should be a means to help us draw near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet ﷺ married, a very clear example. And not just that, he, he said himself, he said to Mary, and he said, and whoever leaves my sunnah, fa laysa minni. Uh, but the reality is with the Prophet ﷺ, there's nothing that actually could have distracted his heart. Right? He was constantly in a state of remembrance, uh, and him being married would not ever take him away from that state. Uh, so when should an individual marry? When he's ready. What does ready mean? When he's financially stable, okay. Okay. Age, financial stability. What else? That's a hard question. Some <laughs> people like wait until you're forty and there's pros to that. Mm. You know. Some people marry at like. Some people marry like at twenty. And yeah. Pros and cons to that as well. Okay. So, how does an individual answer this? I'm not talking about like in general. How would you, when are you ready to get married? I kind of like that answer. If you're a woman, you got to be like 18 to 25. Like if you're a man, like 40. You're good, you're good to go. Sorry. Okay. So he said, initially a man should remain celibate. In indicating here that there should be a, t a period of time, like, Basically, he's saying men should wait a little bit. He's basically saying men should wait a little bit. Why do you guys think that is? Right? It helps build dis discipline, it delayed gratification, gives him time to kind of build himself up and become independent. I think that's definitely important. And he says when he reaches a state of ma'rifa, he should seek marriage. What is he talking about? Of knowing. He should reach a state of knowing. What does that mean? I, I've heard some people say, okay, you know, you need to be mature to get married. What do you guys think about that one? I like fundamentally disagree. I'm like still super immature. <laughs> I think you can mature through the marriage for sure. But I don't think, I don't think that's like a fundamental, you know, part of marriage. Because, you, because when we talk about mature, we're talking about responsible, right? So if this, if this person is independent and they have their own apartment, you would assume that they're kind of responsible, but they might be immature. Like they still laugh at like fart jokes and stuff, right? You know? <laughs> but does that mean, oh, I can't marry this person now? 
I don't, I don't think so. I don't think, I, I don't think that's a very strong criteria. I think finance. Finances, finances, I think is super important. And so I think a person should be financially successful. And what that means to me is that he or she is independent, not she, he more so, <laughs> is that he be independent, that he has his own place, he has his own car. He doesn't need to be rich, right? He just needs to be independent. He needs to be able to stand on his own two feet. And some people, well, well what about, you know, doesn't he need to take care of her? One person doesn't cost that much, like seriously. Like, <laughs> Like in the overall scheme of things, one person really isn't that expensive. It uh, depends on who you marry. <laughs> well, you, bet, you, bet, you, better, you better marry the right person, man. Or you, or you better have that money. So, but, but Matt, if I, is, I, th I think you guys have a general idea of it. It's basically when I, I feel I should, get I should marry, right? Like I'm ready to get married now. That's, that's what it is. That I've reached this point where I'm ready to get married. I'm, I've reached a point where I have a good relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but I need something to help me further it. I need something to better myself. And many times for the person who's married the right person, it, it is that marriage, right? Because it, it gives them that ability now to start prioritizing. It gives them that ability to really introspect and learn more about themselves and to grow. Yep. Uh, so sure. Sometimes I feel like marriage gets in the way of your personal development and some of your like higher goals. Is there merit to that way of thinking or is that, is that a flawed way of thinking? I mean, I don't know how many times you've been married, so. <laughs> I'm asking, right? that's what I don't know. Like. So I've, I've only been married once. So I can't, I don't have like a huge uh, experience. Just like because the, the essence of it. Like. I, I would say that marriage should not be an obstacle to anything. I think that it can cause you to readjust some of your priorities, but I don't think it actually stops you from doing anything. Because like I see so many people like yeah. become so preoccupied with their spouse and then their spouse's families and then they sort of just look like whose side of their... Like, so who's, whose fault is that? Then, but it seems like... Marriage, I've seen this happen so often where it's just like, it just seems like marriage... Does so what, what happens a lot of times, I think, I think what's happened in, in the recent era is the loss of roles between the husband and wife, right? So I think they're kind of like blending and it's becoming like one type of thing. And men are not as forthcoming. They're not as assertive as, as they used to be because the assertive man is considered toxic. Right. This is this is this is the new culture that the assertive man, the one who's strong, the alpha male, he is the one that is wrong. And those characteristics that he has are bad. But if you actually look at the characteristics that many women seek, they are looking for the assertive male who wants to take care of them. Because those lines get blurred, men don't know what their role is and they kind of get lost in the marriage. If I don't know what I'm supposed to do. What am I going to do? I'm just going to follow, you know, I mean, like whoever is the more assertive one, I'm just going to follow them around. It doesn't mean that they're necessarily doing a good job, but I'm just going to still follow them around because I'm running around like with like a chicken with a, my head cut off because I have no idea. But if I understand what my role is in that marriage and <clears throat> understanding a role in the marriage, it doesn't mean you have to be a jerk to your wife, right? That's, that's not what it means, but it's understanding like, okay, there, there can't be two captains to a ship. There can't. Right? You, you have a captain and you have a co-pilot. Right? That, that's just how it works. And they're supposed to support each other's positions. They never take, they never fight over the position. Because if you have two captains, what, where does the ship go? In circles. Right? It, just keep, it just keeps kind of spinning and you get nowhere. And then you know what happens when the ship gets nowhere? The spouses get upset with each other because they don't feel like the marriage is going anywhere. And then what happens to divorces? They start moving up and they start increasing. Men need to be more masculine, just period. Women need to be more feminine, period. Does that mean that, you know, they're jerks to each other? No, man, they, they need to complement each other. Men are fundamentally different than women and women are fundamentally different than men. They're, 
they're biologically, psychologically, in, in so many ways. And if we understand that they're meant to complement each other, it makes the roles in society that much clearer. And when there are clear goalposts, you know exactly what it is that needs to be done. But it, it's, it, that's, that's part of the problem, right? So if, if, a, if a man comes into a marriage and he understands what it is that he's seeking, he's looking for, I have yet to perform a marriage where I've offered the woman saying that, okay, hey, listen, he's financially responsible for you. If you want to contribute voluntarily, go for it. But don't commit yourself to contributing from today. Do you think it's better that you have the option to walk away from work at any point? Or do you want to start contributing from today and kind of shoot yourself in the foot? I have yet to have a woman who says, no, no, I want to, keep, I want to start from today. It's anecdotal. I and mean, these are just my experiences. But I think it's still very telling of where people's mindsets are. And sometimes I've had the guy ask, like, aren't you going to ask me? I was like, no, that's your job. Like, you don't, you don't, you don't get a choice. Like, you don't get a choice in the matter. I was like, you can be upset if you want. I don't really know what to tell you, but, but you don't have a choice. Like, this is your, huh? Or just be subordinate. Yeah, it's not just being be subordinate. It's understanding what my role is. So a lot of people will talk about rights in the marriage, right? Are like, okay, well, I have to find food, food closing and shelter to my wife, right? And she has to be available to me sexually, right? These are the fundamental basis, or these are the fundamental rights in a marriage. Okay, tell you, what if I come home and she, I'm working, she's at home, the, there's no food, the house is not clean, and there's no food. I, I mean, I'm sorry, there's no food, the house is not clean, but she says to me, I'm available to you. And she says, okay, I want to talk to you. And I said, that's not your right. How long do you think that marriage is going to last? It's not going to last at all. Hey, a month is a long time, man. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? Like, we have to understand that marriage is built on more than that. Marriage is built on more than that. And, and that's something that's really important to keep in mind. That there are so many things that go into a marriage. And just because we have a defined role. And defined role, it, again, it doesn't mean that... that Okay, because I'm the alpha male, I need to yell at, no, man. Because you're the alpha male, you have to be kind with your wife. That's, that's part of being a man. That we have to overlook each other's flaws. That's part of being a couple. Every time I see her do something wrong, I go and I try to correct her. I don't yell at her. Why? Because that's my job as a husband. I, I'm, I'm trying to what? To uplift her. But what's, again, because roles are lost, these things aren't happening. And that's why we have people who are lost in the sauce. Can you close that door? So he's saying that if, if a person can't do these things, if he's overcome by desire, right? He's just all he thinks about day and night. He cannot function as a human being. What should this person do? What do you guys think? Huh? Starve, constant hunger and fasting. He's saying that that is also, that's an option. So he should constantly be fasting. If that doesn't work, if his eyes still wander, what should he do? Not right. <laughs> he, he should get married. <laughs> and like we said, these are all external things that we can do. Right? These are all outside factors that we can work on. Um, so... That marriage is supposed to help us restrain our eyes, is so, supposed to help us restrain our thoughts. But putting this in perspe perspective, when I marry, when I marry, is it possible that I see more beautiful women on the night of my marriage? Absolutely. So the goal isn't the beauty, right? We have to understand that marriage is a tool. Marriage is a tool. And we are meant to use that tool to draw near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says that fornication of the eyes is a gateway to what? To fornication of the flesh. This is why it is so fundamental and so important to control. So what about being tempted by adolescent boys? And this is something, again, Ghazali was very early. You know, we're talking about that, uh, 505. And this culture, does it still exist? Yes, it does. 
Where does it exist? Like, where do we hear about it a lot? <laughs> okay, other than Afghanistan. <laughs> Just, I didn't mean a country. <laughs> I meant... <laughs> Should I dress them up as girls? Okay, man, thank you. <laughs> TMI. <laughs> oh, where, where, where do we hear about this a lot? Powerful people. Elites, oh, like... Not just elites, but we hear about this with the clergy, right? If you think about the madrasas and all these places, they're constantly worried about this happening. And Ghazali, very unabashedly, he's talking about this very clearly, that what if a person is tempted by adolescent boys? What should this person do? And, and that temptation can either be sexual or non-sexual. And he brings the likeness of saying that, okay, if you see dead flowers and living flowers, which ones are you naturally going to gravitate to? The living flowers. But are you going to want to kiss the living flowers and stroke them? No, right? You just, you just enjoy them. You just enjoy looking at them. And that's the example that he's giving here. So when he's talking about non-sexually, he's talking about just enjoying the beauty of, of those boys, not in a sexual way. He's saying regardless, marriage is a solution. He said regardless. Again, those outside factors when it comes to sexual desire are extremely important. Because internally, there are a lot of things that we should be doing that are connected back to hunger. And the reason he doesn't repeat those things is because where are they mentioned? In the previous ch six chapters, right? That's all he was talking about. He was just talking about hunger, starvation, fasting. And he's talking about all of the things that happen inside a person and using those tactics and applying them here. In addition to marriage. And he says, this is having that attraction to these boys is actually more dangerous. Why? Because with women, what can I do? I can marry them, right? I can, I can marry a woman. I can't marry this boy. Like this, is, this is impermissible. It's forbidden. So that's why he says this is actually more dangerous. So marriage in and of itself, uh, this should not stop our journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in any way, shape, or form. And if it is, then I need to correct my intention or I need to dissolve the marriage. Right. These, are, these are the two choices that are there. I have to make sure my intention is pure. My intention is clean. Um, I need to make sure I have good character and behavior. You're talking, we were talking about what a person needs to do. This is part of that. Uh, marriage should be avoided for the one who is unable to bring balance. So if a person is an oppressor by nature, he needs to get out of that stage before he marries. If a person is abusive by nature, he needs to get out of that abuse before he marries. There are so many people I know who are abusive, who are thieves, gay, who their parents married them off to, saying that marriage is going to what? It's going to fix them. And what happens in those marriages? Right? They destroyed. Those marriages are destroyed. So much trauma, so much unnecessary trauma in those situations. If a person suffers from something, I guarantee marriage will not fix it. Uh, there, I remember there's this, uh, there's this cousin I had. He wanted to marry somebody who was regular at Fajr. He found a girl who was regular, not in Fajr, but Qiyam. She would regularly pray at Qiyam. They got married. And he had problems with Fajr. What do you guys think happened? They both had problems waking up for Fajr. <laughs> Don't look for marriage as a cure for anything except to help with your desires. So what is the cure? Reiterates a couple of things. Hunger, very important. All the strategies that are related to hunger, all of the issues that are associated with hunger, he mentions again in the previous six chapters. And lowering one's gaze, we had talked about that also. And busying oneself with what? So anything, uh, basically anything that pleases Allah. That can be work, it can be adhkar, it can be dua, it can be ibadah, it can be reading Quran, whatever it is that you enjoy, if you're doing it with the right intention. It can be running, it could be biking, it could be socializing, it could be helping the poor, right? There's so many things that can be done um, by that. But if none of these work, 
marriage is the end solution. You can see a pattern here that he is constantly bringing back the focus on physical, um, the physical focus and also the marital focus. And the reason marriage is so reinforced time and time again is because this is the only halal outlet that we have. This is the only halal outlet that we have for, for full enjoyment. And this is why he keeps mentioning and keeps talking about it. So that's the end. Uh, chapter eight is the last chapter. Inshallah, we'll uh, discuss this and we'll talk about it next week. And that'll be the end of this section. Um, this will be the end of the third section, subhanAllah. Get a good, get a good pace, man. I didn't, I didn't think we'd be moving this quickly. But... Uh, We'll stop here. Wallahu a'lam wa sallallahu ala khayri khalqin nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sallam. If we have any questions, either online or you guys have any questions, we'll take them now. Yeah. So basically, any loose fitting clothing. And by loose fitting, it, it is not form fitting. Okay. So, um, like, so for example, these, you can, you can see the general shape of my leg, right? But you can't see the specific shape of my leg. This would be permissible. This would be permissible for a woman to pray. What does she need to cover during the prayer? What is agreed on is our, that her hands and face can show. There is a difference of opinion over the feet. Outside of Salah? Okay. But inside of Salah, the only difference of opinion is on the feet. As for the clothing, as long again, as long as it's not form-fitting, you do have some um, modern opinions that talk about a woman having to wear abaya. Like she has to wear like some kind of over garment, but I don't I don't think the proofs for that are strong. They, they try using the ayah that, that she takes the khimar to cover over. But again, as long as the clothing is not form-fitting, she is fine. Yes? So if you're wearing like jeans, but not like loose jeans, yeah. they don't have to wear the like salah? Like no, they don't. I mean, but at the end of the day, man, a, a woman should wear what she's comfortable in and she should wear what isn't what isn't revealing and what is revealing revealing is something that you know like skinny jeans are revealing tights are revealing um those are the things that should be avoided that, if he wears them casually in the house uh, there's no problem with that but for prayer no no even outside the house so outside of the house again anything the most lenient opinions on what she can wear outside the house is uh, she can show her feet, she can show her hands, she can show her face. Uh, light makeup is okay. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, anything she wears, she, she can be presentable. Um, she shouldn't wear like any attractive clothes, not attractive clothing. What do I mean by that? Is anything like really loud, you know, anything that would be considered unique. Yeah, I'm sorry? Yeah, you know, I mean, like, you know, wearing like a peacock hat, you know, I mean, like, you know, something that just draws unnecessary attention. So, so you can't have a belly, uh, with, uh, <laughs> belly dancer. So. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> kind of so th these are the type of things that, that she can't, um, she can't wear when she goes out. But like I said, man, as long as, as long as it, it, it isn't form fitting, then she's okay. Um, he was in jail a lot. <laughs> no, I, I, so there are a few scholars who never got the opportunity to marry. And I think Nawi was one, Ibn Taymiyyah was another one. A lot of it had to do with the fact that they're like in and out of jail quite a bit. And I, I think they just never got the opportunity. I don't think any of them actually said like, oh, you shouldn't get married. Imam Ahmad got married quite late. He got married when he was like 40. I don't know. I don't, I don't think that was him. 
I think there, there's there's another there's another story about a man married um, he married somebody's daughter, but she got pox. So like you know she was she was scarred, and um, he proposed to her like he was blind. You know, and then she found out on her deathbed that he could actually see the whole time, and like yeah. You know, I mean, some of these stories, maybe they're, I mean, they're, they could be exaggerated and, you know, I mean, like there's, there's, you, you hear a lot of these stories about the extent that people go to, to find pleasure with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or to help someone or, you know, um, you know, if they're true, may Allah accept. It doesn't make a difference in my life. I don't know. You know. You raise your uh, so in, in the method you would raise your hands again. Yeah, when you're coming up from a court. Uh, the only difference, if the Shafis, they will tell you to raise your hands from when you get up from the second from the first sajda also. The Hamidis, you don't you don't have to. It's just uh, when you're coming up from a court. Do you raise your hands or not? So I said yes. Any other questions? No? All right. Well, actually, yeah. Because you guys are putting a lot of hair. When you mess up and mm. you send them, you just still you just still need the uh... Sajid Sahu? Yes. So uh, the, so every every madhab has their preference. Um, the the Hanbali madhab it's permissible before or after. It's not it's not that big a deal. So I usually tell people do such a sahu when you remember. So if you remember before salam, do it before salam. If you remember after, do it after. So should we say alhamdulillah? You shouldn't say any. You shouldn't say anything in salah. Yeah, yeah. So. No, I say it out loud for them to hear so that they make dua for you. Right? And what if somebody sees this and they don't say Alhamdulillah, but you say Alhamdulillah? <laughs> That's fine. It's not a big deal. May Allah have mercy on you, right? Like, <laughs> it's, you, you don't need to, you know what I mean? It's not a condition for, for that, but you know, if you want to give somebody a second to say it, but even if they don't say it, you say, Alhamdulillah, no problem. But I did that once while I was praying. <laughs> no, it was like I coughed and I said, Alhamdulillah. <laughs> <laughs> and I have it, like I just said. Yeah, yeah. No, no, it's, it's okay. No, no, it, it's okay. Even during Salah, if you, if you say something unintentionally, your prayer is still valid. Like if you start, like if you pick up your phone and start having a conversation, <laughs> then, then that's where it becomes a problem. Yeah. Uh, I know it wasn't even a sneeze, right? <laughs> well, it was fun. I heard someone say that the the knee, not the hawa. Yeah, there's a there's a difference of opinion on whether the knee and the belly button are included in the aura of a man or a woman in front of other women or not. Um, I I, th I don't think they are. I don't think they're part of the aura. I think you can show your knees and your belly button. Well, praying you have to. Praying you should be at least to hear, right? No. Bro? Yeah, it's what, not necessary. What about like the tears? It's too high. So, so he's no, be, because what? No, 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 like so. so not here, not here. All right, you guys don't get excited. All right, but <laughs> here, <laughs> like th this to me would be okay. I'd be I'd be completely fine with this. I wouldn't have a problem with it. Um, you start getting higher than it, then obviously because it's, your knee starts here, right? So the Prophet some said, "Mina rukba ila surra," and from the from the knee, I need the beginning of the knee to the belly button, not from the bottom of the knee to above the belly button. Okay, but some scholars they understand it like like uh, to to include the knee and include the belly button also. So I, I don't think it's that big a deal. I think even culturally, many places like you don't people don't give it a problem. It's only the first row in the masjids that that have problems with everything. <laughs> The one from the last people and they end up pushing everybody to get to the front. Yeah, we know. <laughs> but I have a question. Another question. Yeah. So we're talking about. So let's say you are wearing shorts up here. Yeah. And as long as they don't rise. No, no. My yeah. question is, is you have your like, you, you sag them? Yeah, you sag them down. Yeah. 
That's fine. As long, because everything's covered, right? Everything's covered, yeah. Yeah. So the, the, the problem would be is if you weren't wearing underwear, right? <laughs> but as long as as long as you're wearing underwear, you're fine. Because everything is technically covered. So sometimes people be like, oh, when he bent over, I saw his underwear. It's like, okay, but you didn't see skin. Right? That that's where it would become an actual issue or a problem. But if you're if you're seeing the under, underwear, socially it's inappropriate, right? Socially. But religiously, would his would it still be valid? Still your, um, yeah, it was still, your skin is still covered. Your skin is still covered, and that's what's I'll important. Be uh, no, that, I mean yeah. you don't have you don't have, you don't have control over that. I mean I don't know how fast the, the people are always how, how fast are the fans, like, bro? I'll tell your back I mean how fast are that's what I'm saying actually. Like how fast are the fans? Like what's going on? <laughs> it's just like blowing your shirt off. Like what's happening, man? <laughs> Were you standing above the fan? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it depends on how you tell them, right? Like, brother, you need to pray again. You're, <laughs> you know, you're behind with showing. Like, I don't think that's a very nice way of of saying it. But if someone was like, hey, you know, try to be careful. Yeah, you know what I mean. So, I think there's a there's a way to remind each other. Sometimes we don't always use that way appropriately. But we'll stop here. <laughs> What is it supposed to do? Protect you from pr protect pr protect you. Protect you, bro. You don't feel the protection?